All right, Miss Sue. Uh, first off, thank you for being here. I'm ex this is actually our first time on video together. We've corresponded through email quite a bit over the past several months. Um, and I'm super excited to actually have you on video, see your face, get to meet you kind of the virtual way as we live here in 2023. Um, so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule to be here. And so before we jump into the questions and the topics we're going to talk about today, which I think is super important for this mark for this uh summit specifically is if you don't mind giving us a little bit of a background into yourself a little bit and then specifically i know this from talking to you a little bit but like why getting to why did you want to get into the authoring world and specifically for you being like a romance expert and then you're also a revision coach like why that avenue yeah and also thank you for having me i am super excited to be here i love summits like this where i can talk to people who are my people right just really like make that connection. And I want to talk about more that more to later in this conversation, that that audience connection that we can make as writers and even readers with the author. But where I come from is <laughs> I actually have a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Texas A&M University, which I do not use at all. So I'm here to tell you it's totally okay if you don't use the degree that you have. Um, I have, I am such a romance fanatic. I have been a romance, uh, we're going to say enthusiast mm -hmm. as opposed to addict, um, for most of my life. I was reading scenes before I probably should have been reading scenes. Um, and I just, they just, it's my happy place. And the more I read them, the more I felt compelled to be part of that world. And I actually got into what I do now through reviewing. I used to have a review blog called gravetales.com way back, way back in Suki Stackhouse days. And I just needed to tell other readers about these stories that I loved so much. I was, it was like with, when writers are writing a story, you feel compelled. You're like, I have to get this on the page, right? That was me with reviewing. I just felt like I had to be part of this world. And the more I did that, the more I realized that I had a real uh, talent for developmental editing. It was an author who I was beta reading for an author that was one of my favorite authors. And she said, you know, you could get paid to do this. And I was like, oh my gosh. I could, what, how do I do that? And that sort of just led me into this space where I started doing one-on-one -on -one editing. I became a, an acquiring editor for a traditional publisher. And eventually I realized that I can't work with as many authors as I want to doing one-on-one -on -one developmental edit. So I moved into the coaching space. So I specialize in revision coaching. So I don't tell you how to write the book. If you work with me, you already have to know how to write a book. I teach you how to get to your best story fastest. And I specialize in character-driven fiction. So where, they, where the hero has some sort of a growth arc, they transform because of the decisions they made and they become a better person by the end of the book. So that was a really long way to say, I absolutely love what I do and I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> well put, yeah, it may have sounded long, but it wasn't that bad. And I guess if we didn't know you were a romance fanatic anyways, I could tell by your happily ever after thing hanging behind you there. Cause yes. that's pretty sure how that's how all romance books should end, right? <laughs> They must, or they're not yeah, romance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, every <laughs> every every genre has their trope, and you better not mess them up. Um, that's right. Yep. Okay, cool. So, thank you for explaining that and show you know telling a little bit about yourself. That's great. So, the, what we're going to talk about today is something I think is really important, and I think a lot of authors either don't understand or um, I don't know another word. But I don't mean ignorant in a bad way. I'm, but it's like you don't know what you don't know, right? So, if anybody has a better word for that, you can tell me. But like, it's just, if you don't know something, you don't know it. And it's like, you need somebody to explain it who has, you know, either a track record or knows what they're talking about, or they have some kind of proof to show like, hey, this is this and like, this is why and whatnot. So for this topic, this is a long way of saying how to find <laughs> your niche reader. So I've talked about this with authors before. And I think one thing that can get kind of lost in translation or can, and I'll, I'll be interested in your thoughts on this and confusing for people is they're like well my I'm not writing my book to just one person like I'm writing my book to everybody or like well, you know if I if I target too down if I niche down too much um like then nobody's gonna buy my book I don't think that's true I there's a there's a saying that goes around the online marketing world is riches are in the niches I guess it depends on if you say niche or niche I don't know how it's supposed to be said I don't think anybody does um so like, I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of when you're niching down for your target reader, do you see it as more beneficial than trying to go to everybody? And if so, like, why would that be the case? Yeah, I absolutely agree that you should niche down as much as possible. And that's 
one of the reasons I specifically say I work with romance writers when I do coaching, it is with romance writers because that is my zone of genius. That's where I'm really good. And if I'm going to deliver something, I want it to be amazing, right? As a writer, you put so much effort, time, money, energy, emotions into not just writing your book, revising it, getting it ready for publication, marketing it, selling it, all the things that you do. This is a ton of time and effort, whether you're a professional and you've published 10 books or you're just getting ready for your first one. And if you're going to do all that work, don't you want it to have, don't you want to get the most out of it, right? Like if we want to talk marketing, ROI, right? So what is the return on your investment? And this investment doesn't have to be money. It can be time, it can be emotional energy. And the, the truth is that there is absolutely no way a single book can appeal to every single reader on the planet. And I can prove that to you because you write in a language, right? Let's, I'm speaking English right now and it's an American dialect. If somebody does not read English, there's no way they can like my book. It's not for them because they can't even communicate in the language that I'm speaking. So from just that, the very foundational concept of communication, it's impossible for every reader to be your reader. So you do have to niche down to some degree. How far do you go? Like how far does it make sense to go, right? That's the real question. And I would say it depends on who you are as a writer. So I have this equation I call the audience equation, and it has two parts. The first part is who are you? Who are you as the author? What do you want to write? What, what drives you? What appeals to you? What makes you really just burn, right? Why do you want to get those words on the page? What is that emotional root? And then once you figure out what that is, that's your brand voice. And once you figure out what that is, then you can say, okay, these are the themes that I care about. This is the message I want to send. This is the focus that I want my brand to represent. Who are the readers that perfectly fit with that message I want to send? I call those your one-click readers. It's from my reviewer days because if there was a book that, if there was an author that I knew I trusted everything they wrote, I would just, I don't, I don't care what the book is. I don't need to see the title. I don't need to see the blurb. One click, I bought it, right? Yeah. So I call those your one-click readers. And that's really your niche audience, your niche reader audience. So the second part of that equation is what common traits do those people share? What era did they grow up in? What uh, moral compass do they keep? What language do they speak? What slang do they understand? Um, what tropes do they like to see in their stories? All those sorts of things. Because if you can set up your marketing in a way that it appeals specifically to those people, that's how you get those five-star ratings, like thousands of five-star ratings, right? But if you're appealing to the wrong people, you're going to end up with bad reviews. You're going to end up with complaints. So I would say like, it's not worth my time and effort as a creator to put out something if I'm not going to put it in front of the people that it's meant for, because I want to make sure that those people represent, they give me feedback that is representative of the quality of the book. That was a pretty long answer. Well, I'm just long answers today. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, this is what people are here for. If it was short answers, this wouldn't be a very fun interview. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> it, it makes me think of that kind of saying or term. I don't know who said it, but like, if you if you market to everyone, you market to no one. Or if you write a book right. to everyone, you write a book yeah. to no one. And I know it can be scary, but like we talked a little about this a little bit off air. It was like, I hear this a lot from authors, whether they're first time authors, maybe they're newer, but maybe they're established or they have a lot of books out there. Their fear is writing to one person represents yeah. one person but you're writing to one person that represents a group of people so the important part is like like you said understanding your reader as much as you can um and then that just is like one you know that that jane just represents a bunch of other janes you just but you it's easier for your mind as a human is to focus on one person that represents a group of people um but you mentioned something which is kind of interesting is like how far do you niche down so mm -hmm. it's like, do, when you think about niching down, you mentioned, um, you know, maybe some demographics and language and maybe, you know, maybe some psychological things, maybe where do people live? How do they talk? You know, what do they like to do for fun? All this other stuff. Now, if we're talking like marketing and books and let's talk about genres, is that also niching down? Like, here's your romance genre, but how many subgenres are in a romance genre? Like, then that helps you niche down too. It, do I understand that correctly? Yes. And you're right. There are tons of them. Um, so there's, there's two different levels of audience, the way I think about it in that second part of the equation. And the, 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 the one we care about the most is the niche audience, the ones who are your perfect fit readers. But 
wider than that is your core audience. And those are people who generally like the things that you, the style of things that you write, the, uh, like, let's use romance as an example. Um, if you are not a romance reader, you are not going to be in a romance writer's core or niche audience at all, because you just don't like romance, right? That's <laughs> not your thing. And that's okay. Everybody likes what they like. So no shame. Um, but the core, like a romance writer's core audience would be generally romance. But if there's certain readers who specifically like do not read Regency, do not read sci-fi, right? They only want contemporary. And even within that, they only want um, romantic comedy themes. They want that, that specific feel of a romantic comedy, or they only want first person, present tense, nothing else, right? There, there are some very specific reader uh, desires that people get passionate about, <laughs> passionate about um, that are part of your niche audience. But you can go wider than that because some people are going to be not, maybe not perfectly niche for you, but good enough, like close enough a fit that they will pick up some of your stories because it's enough crossover within that uh, audience demographic, right? So if, if for a romance writer, even if a person prefers contemporary, if you have a historical that has a lot of themes that are relevant to a contemporary romance or a historical romance, then you probably have some crossover with that person. So the niching down is more about what, what resonates with you as an author? What, who are your people, right? When you think about like, if I could be in a room with these people, if I, if, if I could invite all my perfect fit readers into a book club and just have ch chats with them every month, who are those people? What do they look like? And then wider than that are the people that might want to read your books and wouldn't say, this is terrible because I don't like X, Y, or Z, but may not be a perfect fit for all of your books. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does make perfect sense. And I, it's funny because... Um like yourself, I'm sure, but I have like private clients that get, you know, more of my attention than maybe somebody who just asks a question or wants to book a free call, like whatever. So it's like, I see these elements, like they write in vastly different genres, but like you mentioned, you see that like crossover, like this guy writes historical fiction, but there are romantic elements and, you know, or like those clean, cozy elements that could attract a contemporary romance person. It has a happy yes. ending happily ever after as your sign behind you says like so these people <laughs> could they could still mix into your audience like niching down is spe it specifically is very smart but that doesn't mean you're pigeonholed to that just that group of people which leads me to my next question you specifically niche down as much as you can when do you decide to try to go a little bit broader with your audience do you need to master that first or is that just kind of a tactic to keep in mind to make sure you're writing the right book and then you're automatically going after some other things that are close enough along the way. Yeah, I think of it more as as the creator, as the author, I want to appeal to my perfect reader for that story. Now that's going to change a little bit. If you don't write, let it, using romance as an example, if you don't always write historical or you don't always write a specific kind of theme or trope, um, then your, your niche audience for a specific book is going to change a little bit from here to there, but really it comes down to like the way that you write, the feel, the voice of your writing. That's really where the niche comes from. It's like the people that resonate with you as a creator. And that kind of transcends the tropes and genre a little bit. Um, but I think when you're appealing to uh, those perfect fit readers, you're going to catch the wider audience that is a crossover fit for a specific story. Like as a reader, I, I just search for keywords, right? I go on Amazon or what, whatever bookseller and I look for specific keywords for whatever it is I want to read right now. And I might find someone that's not maybe a perfect fit for me, but I can see that the story they're offering satisfies whatever need I have right now. And I might find through reading that story that Maybe I have more in common with this author than I thought I was going to. Maybe I start exploring them a little more. So if you are marketing to your niche, perfect fit readers, you are going to catch some of the, the other readers in your core audience because of the way that you have um, presented your stories. Okay. That makes perfect sense. So this brings me to the burning question that probably everybody's thinking of right now. Like you explained it. It makes sense. Niche down, whatever. Where do you find these people? Where are they? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So let's be clear. I'm not a marketing expert. I am a revision coach. Okay. <laughs> so I cannot tell you how to market specifically. Like I don't have that skill set. I okay. have it for me. I know how I do it for my brand, 
Um, but as a writer, I would say that you want to find somebody who can coach you through specifically exactly what those current trending working tactics are. Um, but generally, uh, as, as far as like kind of wide advice that I have for that is that you should be doing all of the things that people normally advise. I want to be very careful here. Um, I'm not a big social media person. Ooh, I have me social either. media accounts, <laughs> um, but all this advice, like you have to be on social media, you have to be blog posting, you have to, look, you don't have to do anything, do what you want. Like it's, it's your career, right? Um, I only blog, I have a blog and I only put stuff on it when I feel like it's useful to the people I'm working with. Email is my main medium. If you want to be mm -hmm. in my space, we're talking through email because I love, like that's where I write. My words go in the emails. I need to do a word count of how many words I have written in emails this month, but it's probably like a novella's worth. It's a lot. Right? Yeah. Um, so whatever you're passionate about, that's going to come through to your, the people who were in that space for you. So if you are big on social media, then put your brand voice wherever you are. So if you're on TikTok, be sure that whatever you present there represents your author brand voice, and that will automatically connect you to the people who are your niche or core audience readers. Um, same thing with if you're like book marketing. So let's say you have a, you're writing a Facebook ad or you're uh, doing a blurb for a you know, book a listing on, on a bookseller. Be sure you use phrases and um, descriptions, mention tropes. Uh, be sure you have a tone that fits whatever your author brand is. Represent yourself through all the different ways, visual, emotional, text, all the different mediums that you can think of that can communicate an emotion. Be sure that emotion represents who you are. And then whatever platform you're on, your people, once they find you through whatever other marketing strategies you're using, are going to be attracted to you because they feel that connection, that person to person human connection okay does yeah that make, does that make I, sense it does and i actually love the fact that you started that off with like i'm not the person to come to for this like because uh, you know you don't want to be that person that starts spewing off nonsense because you don't want to yeah. be like caught off guard by a question you don't it happens people ask me questions all the time i'm like i don't know i'm not <laughs> right. over there because i can't help you i could try to help you it's gonna take me six months to figure it out that person already knows what they're doing um so like I love that. And then you actually gave some good advice um, in, you know, strategies in there. So like just to, you know, I'm going to pretend you asked me the same question just to give this a little bit more. Go ahead. Ask me the same question, Sue. I'm going to flip the script. Ask me where you find these people and I'm going to give you an answer. <laughs> so, Philip, I would love to know, how do you find these perfect? Where, where are they? Like, seriously, this is so hard. I would like I would like to know. Tell me. <laughs> Tell right. me how you find them. <laughs> in a never done before, um, at least for me, flipping the script on the interviewer to the interviewee. Um, so for me, the best place to find these people is I don't like social media either. I'm not a guy for social media. I am 100% do or die email. So we're on the same page on that because I think that's where you build and create these long lasting deep relationships that are actually meaningful and you can actually be yourself transparently authentically which i think is so big um yeah. when you're talking about you've mentioned this a few times establishing yourself like your voice your style your brand like your you have to be you social mm -hmm. media is so fake and i don't it's not a safe place i don't like it no um, it's not safe <laughs> no so i use places like and i won't go into super detail but places like story origin and book funnel where these targeted people already are so what all you're doing just to put it simply without getting too crazy is you as a i'll use romance as a, an example since that's what we've been talking i'm not a romance author people i don't do it <laughs> i'm fast-paced military <laughs> thrillers kind of on the other end of the spectrum not a whole lot of happily ever afters um so you basically you as a romance author are going onto these platforms you're partnering with other romance authors who have a list of your what could be your ideal readers. And you're just going into this promotion, driving traffic to that page for people to get your reader magnet so they can come onto your list. Mm -hmm. And that's how you continually get the right people on your list. Um, don't worry about social media and all that stuff. If you wanna do that, that's fine. I'm not the guy for that, but um, that's a simple way to find the right people. It's what I do for myself and it's what I do for clients. And it just, it just worked time and time again. And it's really simple because you're only focusing on one or two platforms as opposed to what new social media trend is going on? What platform just launched? I got to learn it. Like, I don't think so, pal. Um, so that's a great question, Sue. I appreciate you asking that. Um, <laughs> oh, happy to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So we talked about, you know, niching down. You have this audience equation. Like what else is important apart? Like it can't, I assume it's not just one part. It's called an equation for a reason. So there's multiple components. What else plays into this equation that's really important? 
Yeah, the first part is understanding who you are. And that step is actually probably the hardest step. That is finding your author brand voice. Whenever, okay, let me ask you, I'm going to ask you another question. Can I ask oh, you another interview question? You sure can. Can, can. can you define voice for me? What is an author's voice? An author's voice? Um, I guess to me, are we talking about writing style or just? That's the question, right? Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I guess to me, it could be two different things. I guess if I'm engaging with my audience, it's just, for me, it's just me sitting down with a buddy, you know, drinking coffee and this is how i talk this is how i this is how i communicate my emails so my voice is for me very casual in tone very laid back as you can see i have a backwards hat on and pink headphones i'm not mr professional <laughs> right so my voice is not a lot of other people's voices um and then that kind of translates into my writing style which is i write by the, I, I write by the seat of my pants um i don't plot stuff out so i think that comes across in the way i when like for example characters interact with each other for me, my goal is to make it very cat, like very natural, and like it's happening in real time, as opposed to feeling plotted out. Just because I can't plot, and it would be terrible. Um, so those would those would be my ex explanations of the two different voices, which is probably way off the path of what you're looking for. <laughs> I think that's actually a really good answer, and the reason I asked is because the first question you said was, "Well, well, what do you mean specifically?" And that is what a lot of people ask: is, "Well, what do you mean by voice?" And I think part of the reason authors struggle to identify their writing voice is because we don't go deep enough. Oh, this is, this is what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm all about dig deeper, dig deeper, dig deeper, right? Like that's the heart of a story is the emotion and the heart of your brand is the emotion. So for me, the way I define voice is it is the emotional feel that your stories leave a reader with. And there's sort of three different phases of that. So the first one is the expectation, the anticipation. So once somebody understands who you are, they expect a certain experience from your books. Assuming that you have niched down enough and you have um, developed a consistent writing style and content theme library. Uh, so people will, if like, okay, for example, I really love Sierra Simone's stories, a romance writer, but I know that she's going to put me in a book coma. Like I'm going to cry and it's going to be angsty and it's going to be like heartbreaking. And there's sometimes you really want that experience. So if I want that experience, I know I can go get a Sierra Simone book, right? And notice how I used her name, Sierra Simone, as, as a descriptor. She's like, when you, when you have a strong author brand, you become an adjective, <laughs> right? So that adjective, like any other adjective, um, it embodies uh, a set of feelings, a very complex emotional uh, experience. That is your brand. So the, there's the expectation phase and there's, there's the experience phase. So as you're going through it, as a reader is going through your story, they're going to experience specific things that you tend to do. And I'm not saying be stereotypical or re repetitive here. I'm talking about the structure that you write with or the content themes you use or the way you end a story, right? Readers need to know what's going to come because they want to have that trust that you're going to deliver that as they're in the experience. And then there's the afterburn. There's that the or the afterglow if you're in the romance world, right? So how does a reader feel after they finish your story? What do they take away from it? It might be a little bit different from the expectation, but it probably is kind of on a similar level, right? So the way they finish the story, you want them to know when, at the end, predictably, I will feel this way. Because we have to be able to plan our lives emotionally. Like I can't just like hop into, I don't do, I don't do like horror or anything scary. I just can't like, it's, <laughs> it, I have nightmares, <laughs> right? So I have to know like your story's not gonna scare me or I'm gonna like, it's gonna break trust, that no like trust factor, which is so such a big part of marketing. So that was a really long way yet again, is to say that your brand is the emotional impression your stories leave on your readers and what they expect you to deliver in a book. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I know you said you're not a marketing expert, but I'm going to ask this question anyways, um, because I have, you know, I have an, an idea of what my answer is. So, but we're talking about, you know, the whole purpose of this summit is, you know, there's a broad spectrum of topics we're talking about, but the whole goal for people coming here, like, how do I get my books in front of more people? And that could be growing your email list, heaven forbid, growing your social media following, if that's what you want to do, but that's <laughs> yeah. cool if you are. Um, yeah. <laughs> making more book sales, getting more page reads, like whatever it is their goal is for marketing. Because I think it's different for everybody. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's subjective to the author, right? Um, but you talked about 
you know, you talk your, you know, voice, author voices, being able to kind of tap into that emotion for whatever it is, the type of book you read, which I think is spot on. So like, I know when I write a book, I'm writing pretty, you would, I tell you right now, you wouldn't enjoy my books. Um, you'd read the first two pages and probably have a nightmare. And just, even if you didn't continue reading, because my goal for the thriller genre is, you know, it usually starts off with some horrific incident of, you know, people dying, you know, kidnapping, just, you know, what like bombs going off, like all these crazy things that are very opposite to romance, but it's very, it, it's a part of the, it's a trope. That's a part of the genre, but my goal for those first few pages is to get, to grip that reader as hard as I can to make them like yeah. picture. This sounds so, so terrible, but like in my first book, the main characters, kids and wife get killed when he's gone. I'm going to sound like a psychopath here. My goal when writing that was to have the reader picture it being their family that happening to, which is, I know it sounds crazy. I have never done this. So don't call the cops on me, but like, that's the whole goal. Because I feel like if I can, if I can grip them early with that strong of an emotion, the chances that they're wanna, going to want to continue to keep reading. Cause they're like, Oh, if that was my family. I definitely want to figure out who did it and put a stop to it. And they just continue reading. So like, that's my goal. That's a long way of saying this is a, this is a theme. <laughs> I might just name this interview the long way of explaining things. The long way. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, is when we're talking about marketing, do you use these same kind of emotions in your voice and the way you talk? Like in, let's say, your emails that you're sending to people to try to drive people to your books. Should the emotion be the same? Should it match the way you write in your books for your genre? Um, or can it differ? Or like it, in another way of asking it is, is it important? to also tap into the emotion with your marketing as it is to putting it into your writing? The answer is yes, absolutely, with a caveat. So if you are, let's talk about Stephen King. See, we all know what Stephen King yeah. writes. Um, but if you have read his memoir on writing, it's a, it feels, it doesn't feel scary. It's not, it's not horror, right? It's, it's a personal conversation about writing fiction. And the, the crossover between what Stephen King publishes and the memoir on writing is the the personal voice behind the story that's i think that is the most important piece you pull forward into your interpersonal communication so if you're talking about like blur marketing blurbs like the book description or taglines things like that you do need to be in in almost like character voice i guess like the way represent the story appropriately so if your story is thrilling then your blurb should match that same feel. But as a person, you probably don't want to be terrifying your readers every time you send them an email, right? So the the way you talk to them there is, here's who I am. Here's the, the part of me I'm willing to share with you, because let's be clear, uh, you do not have to share all of you. There are pieces of you that you should keep private because that's special to you. Like your public persona is whatever you choose it to be. So whatever that public persona is, that is what you infuse into your email communication, into the way you phrase your social media captions or whatever it is that when you're talking directly to a reader, not through some third party selling system. Did that make sense? Yeah, it did. So it's almost like it makes me think of kind of cross pollinating the two. So, you know, if you write in this emotion, but then you, you know, let's say for me, I have more of a casual laid back tone, even though my stories are kind of extreme and fast paced finding a way and i think this is where effective book marketing can really kind of start to take off is finding a way to blend those two which ultimately just becomes your author brand right because it's like yeah they've got they've they've come to know this is how you write your emails and communicate and this is the kind of stories you write and then when you effectively cross them together people are like i have to get that book or the next one or you know whatever it is it's kind of the way i think about it yeah. So it really comes down to building the no like trust factor. And I know like we use that term all the time in the marketing world. No, like they have to know, like, and trust you, <laughs> but it's true. Like it's a thing because it's true. Um, if you think about all the people, especially the writers that you, you are drawn the most to, it's probably because you share some core identity elements with them in some way, whether that's uh, you're some like if you're somebody who's very like brief, you don't want to spend a lot of time gabbing and just like give it to me straight. I'm going to give it to you straight. You probably prefer a marketing voice that is more with more brevity, right? If you're someone like me and maybe you too, uh, I talk a lot. I have I write a lot of words. If you don't like to read a lot of words in your email, I'm probably not the right person for you to be opening emails from, right? 
but that's just me as a person. I'm just chatty and I love getting to know people closer. So the pieces of you that you choose to share, those are, those are the people that you're, the types of readers you're probably going to collect. And by, by collect, I mean, attract to your, whatever it is you're marketing with email list, social media brand, um, that will be part of your sphere of influence for directly marketing your books. You'll still get other people wide. They just won't have as close of a connection to you. They're probably less likely to be your one-click readers because they have that trust on the story level, but not necessarily on the person behind the brand level. Yeah, which and I both think are fine. Both are fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you, you mentioned that I've never heard the one click reader thing. I think that's really cool. Um, it'd be like a cool T-shirt to wear um, <clears throat> is that it, it just speaks to the importance of how, how important everything needs to be from start to finish. I'm talking from cover to title to blurb to um, how you talk, how you like everything needs to be in line with each other, because if one piece is off, it breaks the whole chain and then everything falls off the rails and either you're scrambling to try to figure out what broke it or you're going to have to start from scratch or you're going to be so far. I hear this all the time. You feel so defeated and so far behind. It's mm. like, why even continue? Like, mm -hmm. but I think if you just keep pushing yeah. and figuring it out, like you come to that spot in your career or journey, whatever you want to call it, where you finally find what clicks and it starts you. I, I'll put it this way. Model, go figure out what's working for people. Like if somebody wanted to learn, um, you know, how to properly niche down and find your target readers. Maybe they come to you and it's like, okay, now they know how to do that. Maybe they want to learn email coach, you know, how to build your list. They come to me. They want to learn ads. They go to Brian Bernie. They want to learn audiobooks. They go to Derek Depker. Like figure out all these different strategies and tactics and then make it your own. It's not, you don't have to go copy and paste it. And then you feel so inauthentic if that's even a word, but like you can end up figuring out what works for you over time. And then you make the system work for you specifically and then it's all about rinse and repeat and then obviously the sky is the limit from there from the way i look at it anyways yeah i agree and i think that it's important there's sort of twofold it's important to be sure that whatever marketing you're doing still aligns with the genre expectations of the readers who want that kind of thing so like if i'm looking for a romance book uh there's you know different cover styles represent different themes or subgenres. Um, so if I'm looking for something, I don't really read YA. So if I'm looking for something super, super steamy, I'm probably not gonna go for a cartoon cover, right? As a reader. <laughs> so if you are somebody who writes super steamy stuff, maybe don't use the, the kinds of covers that represent a totally different story type, right? You wanna definitely stay within the current uh, expectations of whatever it is that you're publishing. But it's also important to allow yourself that space to make decisions that represent you uniquely. And I, something that you said uh, made me think of my earlier journey as a blogger was that you get to that point where you're just like, why am I doing this? Like, does anybody care? Nobody sees me. I'm just shouting into a void, right? I, I ran the, my review blog for something like 10 years. And I think the reason people burn out is they don't have a goal. So when I stopped, I stopped probably right at the point where I was gaining a lot of momentum and I could have taken it into the professional space and like run ads and done all that stuff. And I just didn't want to, I was done. I was burned. Right. And I realized I wanted something else. So when writers come to me and they're like, is it, is it worth writing? Like, should I even try? I'm just, what's the point? Well, my question to them is, I don't know. What is the point? What do you want to get out of it? What's your goal? Because if you're not working toward a goal, it doesn't matter what kind of marketing you do. You're never going to get what you want because you don't know what you want. Right. Yeah. And having a goal, like it, like we mentioned in an earlier topic, I don't remember exactly what you're talking about, but like, it's subjective to the author. Is it selling a hundred thousand copies? Is it just getting it in your hands? So you can give it to your kids or your grandkids. Like you just wanted to write and publish one book and say, Hey, look, I have a physical book that I created and developed. And like, that's my goal is accomplished. I'm fine. Or is it to be Mark Dawson and sell millions and millions of copies? Are you going to, do you want to be the next Stephen King? Good luck, but maybe that's your goal. Um, so, you know, goals are very subjective, but I think you, you nailed it. It's so important to, if you don't have that goal when you're starting and your goal can change, but you just have to have mm -hmm. something to aim for, right? Or else the journey is you bet you might as well just be walking blind and everything that happens, you're in this reactive state as opposed to a strategic active, you know, plan that you've actually laid out that, you know, every step you're taking is actually going towards that goal that you're trying to reach. Yeah. And the parallel for that is that 
you should think about your author career the way you think about your character's hero's journey. So when the hero is making decisions in the story, at least for character-driven fiction, um, there's a reason they don't automatically jump to the one thing that is going to make them happy. They have to go through a process of feeling emotions and making decisions and facing challenges. That's the point of the story. We want to experience the journey. And we know how to do that for our heroes because we've learned the structure of the story and all the different techniques. But if you think about your own career, your own life in the same way, you can sort of guide yourself in smart ways. You just have to listen to what you're feeling and what you're thinking and what you want at any given time. And it can always change. Like you said, your goal can totally change. What I want today is not what I wanted last year, or two years ago, or 10 years ago, because you don't know what you're, you don't know what's going to happen to you. But think about how you can harness the power of the hero's literary journey in your own life and in your own career choices to move yourself that one step forward and then just reevaluate and see, where am I? What can I do right now that's going to make me happy? What's my happiness goal? Yeah. And I think if we're looking at successful people, authors are just like in general, like the ultra hyper successful people, they're not looking to take these hundred percent leaps every time they're talking, you're talking like incremental 1% improvements every day. And at a certain point, 1% is huge. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's just these massive, or like when you're starting out, 1% can be huge. As you get bigger, it's a little bit less, but obviously the goals are way bigger. Um, but we, you know, we talked about people wanting to quit and you mentioned your blogging. It was like, well, why do I even continue? There's a quote, I'm just gonna read this real quick and actually have a question for you uh, to get back on topic from this is, Alex Hermosi, for anybody who doesn't know, he's like 30, he's in his early 30s, so he's not much older than me. He's got a company worth $200 million. He just released his second book. He writes nonfiction because he's like a, he's this big email marketer guy, but he has a quote that it's my background on my screen. I'm looking at my phone and he says, whenever I get to a low point where I think, why do I even bother? I just try to remind myself, this is where most people stop and this is why they don't mm. win, mm -hmm. which makes me think of that image everybody's seen where it's a guy digging for gold. And he stops. And if he would have just hit it with the shovel one more time, he would have reached what he was looking for. Um, so, you know, that's just a way of saying if you're on here, because I know I've been here and I've, you know, I, I get knocked down more than anybody I know. And I'm sure most people can relate to this is if you just keep going, you don't know when your breakthrough is going to happen. But if you don't stop, I'm of mind is eventually you're going to hit that breakthrough as long as you're making the right moves and you're not just you know turning the wheels for nothing but like you just keep going and if you feel like stopping like to me that's usually the point where you should buckle in and maybe go even harder um so that's a that's a my two cents on that i could have a whole other topic on that um <laughs> but i have a question I've, I've been wanting to ask you the last five or ten minutes is in terms of niching <laughs> down and i really like where i taught where our conversation went there in terms of niching down we talked about this is how you do it this is the way to do it like stuff like that what about some pitfalls to like, what do you see in terms of, and maybe not even just niching down, but like just in your audience equation that you have and the things that you look at for finding your target readers and stuff like that. What are these common pitfalls or these roadblocks you see authors run into that they have a hard time either seeing coming or even overcoming once they reach that? Um, I, the, the first thing that came to mind when you started asking this question was the word never. And this is a word I've sort of had to train myself not to use um, because unless it's physically impossible, um, I, I feel like the word never is really limiting, right? So if you're an author who says, I am never going to write, oh gosh, I'm trying not to use romance as all the examples, but that's what I do. So I'm going to use it anyway. Um, if you're somebody who's like, okay, I write romance, but I am never going to have an open door sex scene. That means that we see the sex on the page. Um, you may not want to say that publicly. You may not want to like even commit to that because over time you might realize that you need to go there for your character development or story reasons or whatever. Um, another example would be like, I like personally as a, as a human, I'm not a fan of historicals like fiction or anything. I'm just not a historical person. I'm like, give me future, give me modern. I need, <laughs> right. you know, running water, hot water, cell phones. I want all the conveniences, right? So sci-fi, I really like sci-fi. Um, or magic with fantasy. Uh, so if you're somebody who's like, yeah, I am never going to write a historical. So I can, I don't even need those people around, right? Like I can use language that might potentially alienate those people. Um, maybe pull back and think, well, 
you don't know what's going to happen to you in the future. You may decide that you, you're really inspired to write something that falls within that genre. And now you don't have an audience of people who would actually be drawn to that. So that's not to say that you should market to people who are not your niche audience. It's just to say, be careful in the way you phrase things and present things. Try to present it uh, in sort of like an open, open-ended, open-minded conversation about here's what I do and here's what I can offer you, as opposed to this is what I will not offer you, unless there are some things that you're for sure not going to do. Like if you are a romance writer and you know for sure that your readers hate cliff endings, then you should probably put some sort of warning, not really a warning, fake warning, in your book blurb that says guaranteed happy ending, right? Um, so I think I went a little bit off track there, but I think the my biggest uh, reaction to that initial question was try not to box yourself in because you don't know where you're going to go in the future. I also think even if you box yourself in, I don't, I mean, I don't think you really boxed in because I'm the author. I could do whatever the heck I want. Right. Like, <laughs> That's true. Because if That's you true. do, <laughs> Let's say you do hit that never statement and you're like, I've done this before. I've told my email list like, hey, this is a real example, by the way. Hey, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, the topic on Monday is going to be this Wednesday is going to be this mm, Friday because mm -hmm. there are a lot of emails out there that are very like topic specific if they only email like once or twice a day or a week. Yep. It's like Thursday thoughts or motivation Monday. And I tried that. I did it for two weeks. I said, I hate this. I just stopped mm. like I, I, it wasn't a never, but it was like I set an expectation and I was like in my list. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like it. And it's my time I'm putting out there. So I'm just going to start <laughs> now. My emails, I just write day of what I'm thinking, what I want to talk about. Um, and my audience knows that's what's coming. But I think even if you did throw another statement out there and you're like, you know, let me use your romance, you know, example, you know, I'm never going to have an open, would you call it? Open door. Open door sex scene, which is like you do explain the sex scene on the page in the book, whatever. Yep. Like, I'm never going to do that. This is so clean. And, you know, sex has no place in my book, like ever. Okay, that's cool. Well, then maybe you're like, you get to a point as your character develops and you're like, she kind of needs... Uh, she's now she's because of what she's gone through she's been screwed over this many times she's got now she's got more confidence she's a little more edgy than she was when the verse book came out like this kind of fits her character yeah. now i just right. say go for it maybe tell your audience it's coming maybe be yes, like hey right. you've been with me since book one now i'm on book six you've seen her develop and grow into this person just a heads up she's a little more edgy now this might come up in a book or i've written this and then if they don't read it they don't read it i don't really care i mean you'll find people <laughs> right. that then you can then you can go find people who do like that and you can just right. segment your list out right. i mean this is getting yeah. into the weeds but like <laughs> right there are ways around it if you feel like you've pigeonholed yourself in just remember you're the author you get to write what you want to write you get to talk about what you want to talk about don't let anybody kind of handcuff you from doing even if you've handcuffed yourself like to me i just say either got the keys or just break the handcuffs off and just do what you want anyways um so maybe i'm a loose cannon but that's how i look at it <laughs> well i think too it's also about um evolution right so part of what you're saying is it's okay to evolve as an author and i 1000 percent agree because the person like we said the person that you are today is not the person you're going to be tomorrow so as long as you have an open conversation open conversation be honest and you know vulnerable to a point with your audience, your readers, um, it's sort of inviting them into your decision-making process. They get to understand you a little bit better. And that is something they can also relate to because maybe they are also evolving as you are. Some people are going to evolve out of your niche audience and some are going to evolve into your niche audience. So as long as you as a brand are continuing to just be true to who you are, even if that changes over time, that's great. That's healthy, I think. I agree. And here, here's kind of a workaround around it. If you're worried about making a giant leap from what you've been writing to maybe something you want to explore. When I have an idea for something, I just send a poll to my email list. I'm like, Hey, here are some options of what I'm thinking, or here are some ideas. What attract, what are you attracted to? What are you not? Or do you like a or B better? You get enough people to respond. You can see an overwhelming sway one way or the other. Hopefully you don't get 50, 50, because then I don't know what you do then. Um, but if do you want. yeah, I just do what I want anyways. Right. Um, <laughs> But that way you'll get an idea of you. Not only do they feel, and my audience loves this, and I think probably most audiences do, then they feel included, like you said. Like now they're a part of the decision process. They're like, oh, this author is thinking of making a change or an idea and they want me to weigh in with my input and opinion. They 
bull- eat that up. And that's just another yeah. way to, and it all ties back into marketing. That's just another way to develop a deeper relationship with your audience. Um, and then when the time comes and that book comes out or that scene, whatever it is, they're, I mean, they're going to feel like they were included. So they're going to be more likely to kind of jump on the opportunity just from the way I see it anyways. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I think it, one of the rewarding parts of being in touch with your audience is that they email you or they reach out to you in some way and they tell you how you made a difference in their life. You, you saw me. Uh, I feel I, I agree with you. Uh, this this really meant something special to me. And I love getting those emails because it it's like that previous feeling where I was like shouting into the void and nobody cares. <laughs> this is the opposite side of that. This is like once I have I've become real enough with people in a way that's safe for me. Um, that they understand who I am, the right people find me and they email me and they're like, thank you for seeing me. And I'm like, no, thank you for seeing me. Really. It's a conversation that we just have through nonverbal ways. Sometimes it's just this feeling of being understood and being seen. And that's part of the magic of being a creator of fiction stories. A hundred percent agree. Yeah. I think that's beautifully put. Um, okay. I don't have any more like specific questions off the top of my mind. So like for you, everything we've covered and talked about, um, and I know we went outside the realm of the specific conversation at the start, but these are actually kind of my favorite kind of interviews. If you're listening and watching (laughs) and you hate this, I am so sorry, but just you're going to have to get over it because we're too far in now. Um, Is is there anything maybe we didn't touch on, maybe a question I didn't ask that would have been relevant or anything you would maybe want to reiterate or emphasize um, before we try to wrap this thing up? I am always, I'm a very heart led sort of coach and um, editor when I do personal revisions. And my advice for an author always comes back to just be true to you. And if you don't know what that means, then think about what you want. Think about what you're feeling right now and why you're feeling that thing. All of my uh, revision techniques are actually based in fear, which is kind of a weird thing to say for a romance editor, right? Um, But if you think about it, all humans are afraid of something many somethings all at the same time. And the root of that fear is an emotional experience. We don't want to experience feeling a certain way. So therefore we take actions to protect ourselves from doing those things. So if you are struggling, this is true for your heroes, but let's just talk about authors for a sec. Um, if you are struggling with decisions to make in your, your books, in your career, in your marketing, anything, think about why you feel resistance and what the, the root of that is. And just really like noodle on it, like let yourself have that freedom to not make a decision, not take an action, just sit in it and understand yourself. Because until you understand yourself, you can never have a strong author brand because you're just following what everybody else says to do. You need to be able to make decisions that come from you, not from somebody else's advice. So just give yourself some grace and some space and some freedom to feel. That's my advice. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's perfect because I think, you know, two huge pillars for my, not myself in my life with my kids and my wife and stuff like that, but also in my business and even my authoring side of things is I think two of the biggest components that anybody can include in what they're trying to do is transparency and being authentic. So authenticity is like, because there's only, this sounds so, I, I hate saying this, this sounds so cliche and so dumb, but like, you're the only you in the world. But like, what I mean by that is, nobody can be you the way you are. So like yes. people could try to emulate me, but like they're only going to be as sarcastic and as quick witted and laid back as I am, but I'm going to be a little bit further along than that. Or, you know, the person across the tables, you know, I could act well put together and maybe speak better and stuff like that. But like, maybe they're always going to be, cause that's who they are compared to who I am. So I think authenticity and transparency in your author brand your marketing efforts, I think it can play huge dividends in your marketing efforts because people are going to start to see a trend in how you communicate and how you do things. And that's what they're going to be attracted to. And that's how you're going to start attracting people like them. We talked about niching down. You've attracted the perfect person. Now let's go find as many other people like that and bring them in with us. And I think that's where things can start to kind of take off. Um, But also, I think you have to look at it as, you know, I'm curious your thoughts on this too. I said we were going to wrap up. I lied, people. Um, is this is my conversations go this way too by the way (laughs) yeah i lied buckle in for another 45 minutes no i I swear i'm getting close um is authoring is not a sprint it's a marathon it's another cliche it's like the fifth one i've dropped but i hear it so often when i'm talking to authors they're like 
well, what if my first book doesn't sell or what if nobody sees it? I'm like, I, it's probably going to be the case. I hate to break it to you. Like the first one's probably not going to be the one that makes it unless you're honorary quarter said this one time to me when I was interviewing her. It's like, unless you're a unicorn or unless you happen to catch lightning in a bottle, like you're not going to be the one book success that blows up and you don't have to ever write a book again. Like you have to think long term. And this is marketing. Lo marketing is a long term strategy. It's implementing things in the short term present, figuring them out, teetering, testing to create a long term strategy that then you can rinse and repeat and just kind of turn the faucet on and off whenever you want. Um, so do you agree with that? The whole, you know, making sure you're thinking long term early on as opposed to like, what can I do to win right now as opposed to never even thinking about what the future? Yes, I actually had to make some notes because there's so, so many things you're saying are like sparking things in my brain. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm losing them. I have to write them down. This is like me doing a, a, a like a coaching session. too. I'm just like, oh, gosh, oh, hold on. <laughs> you got to write everything. Um, so the one of the things that I love that you said was about the first book you write is probably not going to be your best book. It's definitely not going to be your best book. Um, and a really good way, if you want to make yourself feel good, is to find a very prolific, very successful author that you love and go back and find the first book they published, it, it, maybe first two or three, right? Especially if they are in the newer era, if they're self-published and then got picked up by a traditional publisher or vice versa. Um, because their, their style can change so much. Like Nora Roberts uh, is a good example of this. Um, Nalini Singh is a really good example of this. I, I was, I'm such a Nalini Singh fangirl, her romance and her urban fantasy. And I, I was just like out of books to read. I had read everything. So I went to back to find just like the something I hadn't read. And I found this one from like way back, way back. And I was like, yay, it's a one click, right? She's my one click author. And I, I buy it and I'm like, this doesn't even sound like her. Like, I don't, this could be a different, a different author, right? It's not even the same because you got to start somewhere and there's nothing wrong with that. You can't, you can't be perfect out of the gate and perfect doesn't even mean anything, right? Uh, Stephen King is Stephen King because of who he has evolved into through the choices that he has made. And that's how you will evolve as well. Um, what was my other note? I can't even read my handwriting sometimes. Oh, you know doctor handwriting. <laughs> I do. I do. Uh, yes. Um, organic marketing is the other thing that came to mind when you started talking about this topic. Um, what we're doing with our marketing efforts is building a pool of people who know, like, and trust us because we resonate with them on some human level. And when you do that, when you start to uh, establish that momentum, even before you get to critical momentum, the people who are your perfect fit fans, they're going to tell their friends about you. And those people are going to read your books. And if they're a perfect fit fan, they're going to tell their friends about you. So it's definitely a long game in some aspects. Like, yes, your marketing could sell books right now, but, and, and there's a backlist and there's a lot of marketing tactics you could do around that. Right. But realistically, if you're trying to just create a healthy community of fans, of loyal fans, word of mouth and organic spread is so valuable. And it's not really something that you can directly implement. It's something that you become successful at because you are authentic, because you do take the time to present the brand that makes the most sense for who you are and what your stories represent. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Because um, I think, and this will be, a, I'll, I'll be interviewing somebody about this on a separate topic, but people always ask me this question of like, Amazon ads, BookBub ads, think like, when do I start running ads? It's like, I mean, how many books do you have? How long you been doing it? It's like, oh, I've got a book out or my book's about to come out. I'm like, all right, well, you, I like the long-term strategy you're thinking about because that's what we talked about. But like, you're not, you're not quite there yet. Like, let's focus on building your fan base, getting people in your audience, in your list. To me, audience and email list are interchangeable because I don't do social media. So like when I say audience, I, I mean email list. Um, yeah. So it's like, start growing that aspect of your, you know, your career and your journey because then when you have five books or seven or 10 or 20 and you can start either running ads to kind of put icing on the cake, but now you have all these people that you've been continually getting on connecting with, they get value from your emails. They know what to expect. They like you, they know you, they trust you, like you mentioned, which is huge, uh, which I think email list is the best place to do that. In my opinion, then you start adding other kind of advanced tactics in with testing ads or getting ads to work on top of what you've already built. So yeah. that foundation and then you could start building the, the adding the accessories and getting the cool appliances and stuff like that to build that, you know, house that you've been, your goal that you, you're trying to reach um, is kind of how I look at it. So, and you said one thing in there that was spot on is 
perfect's not really a thing, right? Like, yeah. I don't care who you are, not one single book. And people can tell, there's not one single book that's ever been written that will ever be written that is perfect. Maybe with AI, they'll figure out a way. But like, even with big books I read, I'm like, oh, they typo or missed comma or wrong word or something. It's like, because it's, we're humans, there's error. Like, so if you're waiting to like get your book perfect, you might as well just stop because it's never going to be perfect. So mm -hmm. that's me. That's coming a long round way of saying, just start, just figure out something to focus on and get started. So you can start learning now. And then you can start building on that strategy and those processes that are going to pay your dividends in the long run. Can I just add one more thing to that? I know we are going along. Um, I would say I'm sorry, but I'm not because I'm having a great time. I'm not either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, something you said there was just start. And that made me think of, I don't know if this is a thing in other genres, but in romance, especially in romance, like what used to be the National Romance Organization, um, we have a lot of contests. And writers, there are specific contests for unpublished writers. You can win special awards that are like given out by chapters. Um, and people will hold off on publishing their first book because they want to qualify for the unpublished writer contest because the more awards that you can garner before you publish your book, uh, the, the more appealing you are to a reader. And I would say to, to some degree, maybe that's true, like seeing letters in an, an author's name like USA Today, bestseller, New York Times, bestseller. Yes, those are influential, but they're not as important as all the other things that you're doing to present that book to people. So if you are a new writer who is trying to get your, you want to win all those contests and you want to like perfect those first chapters. Um, as somebody who has read a lot of first chapters as an acquiring editor and as a contest judge and as a coach, uh, if your entire book doesn't match the quality of your first three chapters, you're going to lose people, right? So I would say don't stress too much about getting a perfect, about winning awards, about trying to hit some level of importance before you release your book, just start making progress, professional progress, release the book. Yeah. It's probably not going to be great. That's okay. You're going to get better work with professionals who can make you better. Like coaches, editors, teachers, all of that stuff is super important when you invest strategically, not before you're ready when you're ready, yeah. because you, at some point you need help to get to the next level. And you can't do it by yourself, but you can't get to that point unless you start, unless you publish that book and deal with the reviews that come in. Right. Yep. I agree with that. That's a hundred percent spot on. People will always find a way to be like, Oh, I gotta do this first. or this needs to be in place first. It's like, if you would just take your first freaking step, <laughs> like, you'll be surprised. Six months is going to pass regardless of whether you take action or not. So you might as well just take action is how I look at it. Um, Okay, I swear I, I'm done talking, to everybody. So, um, <laughs> so Miss Sue, we talked about the audience equation and stuff like that. And I know you got a cool freebie for people listening. So, why don't you tell us what that might be? Yes. So during the during this summit, you can download uh, part two of my audience equation. It is a I'll say brief for me PDF. <laughs> we we both know that I'm verbose. Um, it's a brief PDF that explains the uh, audience, the analysis audience part that we talked about today. Like, who are the people? How do you figure out like the shared traits that they have? It's a series of um, sort of thought provoking observations and questions. Now, there is also a separate strategy guide, the Storyteller's Superfan Strategy Guide, which I created as a companion to this informational PDF. And that is part of the summit bundle and it is exclusively in the summit bundle. So it's a workbook that walks you through how to unearth those qualities of your niche readers for your brand. By I ask you questions, you fill in the blanks. By the time you get to the end, you have a snapshot of who your Jane, your avatar, your uh, collection of perfect fit readers are based on shared traits. And that is right now only in the bundle. So pick that up before it's on my website as a separate thing. Um, I also will be offering part one of the audience equation, which talks about voice and you can get more details about that through the PDF. So just grab the PDF. It's free. Okay, cool. Yeah. So the free PDF will be in the link under this page. Um, if you want, so it's like the PDF is kind of do it yourself, read through, and then the bundle, the, that you're putting in the bundle, the kind of the next step up is almost like a done with you where you're asking, I know you're like on screen with these people, but like you're asking them questions that you've written out and they're responding to it. So it's a little bit more handholding, which is always the way you want to go. You want to try to figure some things out by yourself and then get a little bit more help and a little bit more help. Um, 
So I suggest downloading that PDF. And then if you're interested in kind of taking the next step, obviously that's going to be inside that bundle on the other side. Um, all right, sweet. So if people wanted to check you out outside of getting that bundle, um, where would they go and find you online? And if you say social media, <laughs> this interview is over. <laughs> Well, it's pretty much over anyway. Um, my website is absolutely the best place to find me. All you you can just meet me there. Like it's it's my personality is all over that website. If you haven't already gotten it from this interview, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that is suebrownmore.com. Any if you sign up for any of my freebies uh, or just my subscribe page, you will get my email newsletter, which we already talked about is the best way to be in contact with me because that's that's like like you, Philip, like that's, that's my medium. I love email Mark. It's just my, it's my happy place. Um, I am on social media, however, at Instagram and on Facebook at Sue Brown Moore. I will caution you that I'm not very active there, but you can follow me. And occasionally I do post some things. Okay, cool. That's all right. I'll let that one slide. <laughs> I'll make sure not to cut that out of the interview. Um, all right, Ms. Sue, I've taken enough of your time. I think we could both sit here and talk for hours and hours. Um, but I will release the audience from having to endure any more of our chit chat, <laughs> even though I've loved it. <laughs> so this Me has too. been a lot of fun. Um, so thanks again for your time and anybody listening. I grab, I always grab things from these interviews. Th stuff I didn't know before, or maybe uh, a topic that is explained in a different way that kind of gives me one of those light bulb moments. Um, and that happened today. So I appreciate you sharing it, being open and, you know, authentic and transparent, which is all we can ask for. And yeah, thank you for everybody who if you're either watching or listening, however you're taking this information in, and we will see you guys in the next one. Thank you.